Welcome, Dr. Naidu. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Good to be with all of you. Yeah, it's good to see you again. Thank you so much for participating today in Climate Action Live. Tell us, where are you? I'm in Johannesburg, and uh, we are experiencing what is known as load shedding, which is where we have these long electricity cuts. So I hope my backup system holds for this interview. <laughs> wow, we hope it holds too, very much so. So, uh, Kumi, could you tell us about yourself and your personal journey to this point? Well, I've been, uh, I, I was thrown up in a product of the South African liberation struggle. I got involved at the age of 15 in the national campaign to fight against the inequality in education. Uh, the slogan at the front of that first march was, we want equality. By the time the slogan got to the younger kids at the back of the march, the younger kids were ch chanting, we want a color TV, because they thought that was the slogan at the front of the march. If I'm brutally honest, at that age, we probably wanted a color TV and equality in education almost equally, and both were equally unattainable at that time. But the fact that the government expelled us from school and we had to self-study and so on, meant that we became sort of deeply dedicated activists trying to end the system of apartheid. That saw me needing to flee into exile. I was lucky to get a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford University. And the moment Mandela returned, was uh, released from prison one month later, I came back home to help prepare for the first democratic elections. And then soon thereafter, realized that it was one thing being part of the liberation struggle, it's another thing going into politics and decided to stay out and rebuild civil society because many people left uh, NGOs to go to government. And we jokingly used to say at that time during the transition, the term NGO didn't stand any longer for non-governmental organization, but better could be used to say not next government official because so many people from NGOs went into, into staffing the new democratic government. So I stayed out to help rebuild. Uh, and uh, worked with the South African NGO coalition, the umbrella body, and then began to serve globally. My global service was first with the Civicus World Alliance for Citizen Participation for 10 years, a body that advocated for the space for citizens to be able to participate actively in public life and advocated and pushed for that. I then spent six years with uh, as the head of Greenpeace International, basically from the Copenhagen negotiations in 2009 to the Paris negotiations in 2015, and then spent some years building Africans Rising for Justice, Peace and Dignity and African White Social Movement. And thereafter, I spent some time, uh, two years as the head of Amnesty International, and I'm back home in South Africa now, uh, working at a very grassroots level in the community where I live. And I also serve as a senior advisor to the Community Arts Network that is trying to bring arts, culture and activism together. Kimi, you have had the most absolutely incredible career, haven't you? I mean, it, it's, uh, it's just such a privilege and an honour for Peace One Day uh, to have you participating. And I really thank you for your time. And I want to ask you, where do you think we are in relation to saving our shared planet? So... People like myself have probably said it multiple times, you know, save the planet, save the climate, save the environment. You know, I like to say that the honest truth is we don't need to save the climate. Uh, we don't need to save the planet. The planet actually does not need saving. What I mean by this is if we continue on the suicidal trajectory that we're on, the end result is we will be gone, but the planet will still be here. And everybody who's worried about the, saving the planet, don't worry, because once we become extinct as a species, the oceans will recover, the forests will grow back, and so on. So we need to understand that the struggle to avert catastrophic climate change is nothing more and nothing less than securing our children and their children's future. When we look at the current reality, I would say we have to find the right balance between speaking truth to power on the one end that is not sanitizing our deeper crisis we find ourselves in, but doing it in a way that does not demotivate, immobilize, and depress people uh, at the same time. And that's a very difficult leadership challenge that we have. So right now, the window of opportunity is small to uh, and closing very fast. 
But we must be saying to ourselves at this moment of history that pessimism is a challenge, is a luxury that we simply, simply cannot afford. And the pessimism of our analysis is best overcome by the optimism of our thoughts, our actions, and our courage. So when people ask the question, is it too late? Let me just say that for millions of people, it's too late. In my home city last year, in two days, we had Durban, South Africa. We had what the local people called a rain bomb. Suddenly, so much of rain that they had never seen before. And 450 people lost their lives in two days. Of course, the global media would not focus about it because these were lives of people of color in Africa, which sadly doesn't seem to matter too much in the global north. So, uh, so basically, we're in a serious situation. And the good news is that all the technical knowledge that we have is there to make the changes. But what we are lacking is political will. And thankfully, political will in many places around the world is a renewable resource, uh, if you know what I mean, in the sense that we can, uh, if we mobilize well, get those that are holding back progress on climate and other intersecting injustices um, re hopefully replaced. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, what I mean, you know, as we presently, you know, as we presently are at this point, what are the strengths and the weaknesses of the current climate activism? I mean, you know, what and what more can be done? So let me start. You know, <laughs> let me say that I've been in the climate movement, so I don't want to for a long time. Uh, so I don't want to talk about what we're doing well. Really, let others talk about it. Uh, we need to focus. This is a moment where we need to tell no lies and claim no easy victories. We need to be brutally honest with ourselves about our shortcomings. We need to be brutally honest with ourselves that we are winning battles, but losing the overall war, and that we are in this to actually ensure that we can avert the worst of the crisis. So, yes, it's true that people in... Uh, uh, places that have contributed least to the problem are paying you know, the first and most brutal price. And that one of the sad realities that we must note, that we're not simply dealing with the issue of climate injustice, right? Uh, and this is one of the weaknesses that we have not in the past dealt with the problem of climate change as an intersectional issue. In fact, Western environmentalism was and is a problem because it tended to put environmentalism in a silo and sort of development, human rights, and so on as competing agendas. So the one of the things that we need to, to, to change right now is we need to turbocharge uh, intersectionality to address the absence of that deep sense of intersectionality because we don't mobilize people if we talk in highfalutin terms uh, about climate change. And that takes me to the second uh, weakness that we have, which is our communications deficit. It's true we have one problem where we don't have access to the kinds of media to tell the urgent story that we need to because of media ownership and either corporate-dominated or uh, state-dominated media and so on. But even ourselves and the way we communicate, and maybe if I might just give you a very simple personal kind of criticism, right? So I'm on a small inflatable boat going to occupy an oil rig in Greenland in 2011. And my colleagues could see I was very nervous because I don't swim very well. And they said to me, oh, don't worry. If you fall in the ocean here with what you're wearing, you'll survive for two hours and we can, you know, we'll, we'll be able to save you. And then I suddenly had this horrible thought, shoot, the waves are really big. They might not see me. And then I had this sense if this was the last action that I was engaged in, the banner that I was carrying which said stop Arctic destruction probably would not be understood, right, by the majority of people where I come from. So anyway, when I get back home a couple of weeks ago, back home to Africa, one of the kids in my family says to me, Uncle Kumi, what a stupid slogan, stop Arctic destruction. This was in 2011 when people mostly didn't understand, even the climate movement didn't understand that the Arctic is a refrigerator or a conditioner of the planet. The ice, when it's there, takes the ashness of the sun's rays and reflects it back. When the ice is not there, it's shooting down and creating an Arctic vortex and, vortex and so on. So 
this young person in my family tells me, actually a better slogan would have been, save Santa Claus now. And what she was saying to me is, one of the problems of activism is that you all are projecting your consciousness on us rather than understanding where we are and building from where we are. And what she was saying is, if you take the Arctic, the only connection that people in Africa and most parts of the global south, which is the global majority in the world, you know, the only connection they have with that is that Santa Claus hangs out there for most of the year. Now, just for anybody who thinks that I actually do believe that Santa Claus exists, I don't. But but in cultural terms, it is where the connection is, and that is what needs to change. So we have a terrible communications deficit that we need to address. The strengths for me is in the vision of young people, the boldness of young people, the fact that young people are recognizing that to address climate change, you don't, you can't address it without addressing the deep levels of inequality between global north and global south, the deep levels of inequality between the consumption. And they also recognize that our very movements cannot continue to reflect the sort of structural racism of the reality of the world, that we need to build movements that look like how the world looks like. And those are, and I think we need to very much say to young people today, that they must resist the idea when people in my generation say young people are the leaders of tomorrow. If you wait for tomorrow, there might not be a tomorrow for you, you to lead. And for that reason, I, I draw my inspiration from young people right now and from some of the things that they're doing and also from young people's vision also in terms of the technologies that they are coming up with and so on. And I really think that the task of my generation is to create enabling spaces for young people to take leadership now, because we have been a colossal disaster, my generation, and we should not continue to occupy as much space as we do. We've got um, about three minutes, just under three minutes left. Kimi, I want to ask you two things. Um, I mean, when you look out there, I mean, there are so many incredible organisations and charities, you know, doing extraordinary work, as you know. And of course, every little you know, piece that we can do makes all, all the difference. Right. I mean, that's how it's going to change. Um, when you look out there, what sort of organisations are you really you know, impressed with and that are inspiring you with the work that they do? So this question, I, I thought I would turn it around a bit rather than say three organizations, because there's so many amazing organizations doing amazing things. I thought, what would be the three currents at the moment that are really got a real momentum behind them that we need to encourage? The first current I would say is a uh, one which is what I'd call is energizing artivism where to address the communications deficit we are seeing in many parts of the world, arts, culture, and activism is coming together. It's more organic, it's respecting the cultural rhythms of people, and so on. And I think that those organizations that embrace arts and culture in a more organic way are going to be able to more successfully communicate and impact on people. The second uh, trend, I would say, is uh, turbocharging intersectionality. And that is not to think in silos as we have done in the past and to actually ensure that we are connecting different agendas. And yeah, I would say that the International Trade Union Confederation, which, you know, in the old days, we used to talk about red green tensions. That means the tensions between labor and environmentalism. Uh, IT, the International Trade Union Confederation, as an example, has made huge steps towards uh, bridging the sort of red-green divide, if you want, and the other divides that come with it. And the third trend, I would say, is embracing creative maladjustment. So when I talk about in cre embracing creative maladjustment, this is a concept from Martin Luther King. These are organizations that are not prepared to accept the status quo, and they recognize that what is needed to address climate change is not simply like after COVID and after the global financial crisis, our leaders simply do system protection, system recovery, and system innovation. These are people who believe that what we need is system innovation, system redesign, and system transformation. Wow, wow, wow. So don't accept the status quo, intersectionality, and kind of constructive narrative in the arts. Three incredible things there. Listen, we've got 14 seconds. I have to ask you, how can people find out about the amazing things that you do? Where, where can we go? 
So right now, we've just launched the Rikirik Foundation for the promotion of artivism, and we've launched, uh, so you can go to that foundation's website, as well as recognizing that one of the things we must do in the climate movement is take care of the mental health of all of us because it's being challenged by climate anxiety. And for that reason, we've launched a new campaign here in South Africa called The Stronger Campaign with a song which honors uh, an, act, uh, an artist that we lost, Ricky Rick. I hope uh, you enjoy listening to the song and being part of supporting mental health also as part of addressing the resilience of the climate movement. Thank you. Kimi, you're absolutely incredible. Thank you for joining us again, Climate Action Live. We wish you the very best on your incredible journey. <music>